Welcome to Wrestling with Success, the best and only podcast for the wrestlers of tomorrow. Please welcome your host, Neil Nile Nigel. Oh, right. <clears throat> your host and future champion, Neil McMillan. Right, so guys and girls, welcome to another episode of Wrestling With Success. And today I have an amazing guest for you all. Please let me introduce you to the Commissioner, the Train Controller, the GM, the General Manager, the Head Honcho, the Head Trainer and Booker at Dropkicks Wrestling, the Fabulous One himself, Mr. Lucas Jackson. Hello Lucas, how are you? I'm good. I thank you very much for that, um, you know, enthusiastic introduction. And I'm hoping that obviously we're gonna have a lot of fun um, doing this podcast. Um, I'm honoured to be the first guest, um, and I'm doing yeah, I'm doing really well. Thanks. How are you doing? Yes, very well, thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show, and uh, hopefully all goes well on the first recording of uh, of uh, being the first guest on the show. So, Lucas, let's just uh, kick things off straight away. First off. Uh, Tell us a little bit about you and how you were introduced into the wrestling world. Um, well, obviously, like every, like everyone really that's in, in the business, um, I my first introduction to wrestling was, you know, as a fan. You know, I you know I've always liked wrestling since since I was young, and it's something which has always stayed with me. Um, you know, I remember watching things. You know, when I was you know, well, the knee eye to grasshoppers, as they say. And, you know, the first person I ever saw was Sting. The first match I ever watched was Sting versus Ric Flair. And this is going back to kind of, well, I said the early 90s. And I've always just been a fan. I mean, I saw Sting and the face pain and, you know, his, his energy in, in the, inside the ring and kind of his personality outside the ring. It really just, I just gravitated towards that. And even though it's a bit unpopular, with some people nowadays opinion but I've always been a stickler for the good guys like I've always enjoyed the good guys more than the bad guys in wrestling you know the villains you know I've always enjoyed the baby faces and you know I've always enjoyed people like Sting Hogan I was a big fan of um, you know I, I just think the energy that some of the faces in the past brought and the characters um, and everything else on top of it that the faces have brought you know I've just always enjoyed I mean in terms of to, to the drop kicks though, you know, I was introduced to that, you know, way back in 2004. And I mean, um, you know, there's a story here where obviously, um, you know, I had originally seen, there's a, there's a documentary on Channel, on Channel 4 called Lock Up Your Sons. And that dealt with um, backyard, um, you know, uh, backyard wrestling. And it featured a, a segment where basically this group of backyard wrestlers had, you know, attended a training school. And it was drop kicks, um, and it was Frank Ryman and Tony Scarlo who were teaching these backyarders kind of how to bump. Um, and my uh, close friend, um, you know, personally and professionally, really, um, who was out for drop kicks, as Dan Hills, we were at school at the time, and we just thought that would be cool to kind of give it a try. And you know, the first time we ever went, we were terrified for whatever reason, telling our parents, you know, that we was going. Um, and so we made up this um, bullshit story saying how we, we were going to go and see the Jackie Chan film, the uh, tuxedo. And, you know, we then, <laughs> yeah, I still haven't seen the film, it's a funny thing. Um, yeah. the um, <laughs> the, uh, it's yeah, not very good, it's not his best. Off. It's not his best, okay, well, yeah, that probably makes up for it then, I guess. <laughs> but um, we, you know, we started on this uh, kind of three-hour mecca from London to Perthley. Um, you know, all, all different trains and, you know, you know, all different trains and all that to get to Perthley. And, you know, we, we walked in, you know, we walked in as the two newcomers to that session. And, you know, we looked around and we saw obviously a ring, a small ring, but a ring nonetheless, um, which had Paul Robinson and Marty Skull inside it. Um, we then saw the uh, massive area of drop kicks, um, which, you know, at that time was occupied by people such as Nick Aldis. Um, uh, who went on, on to obviously be, be the Gladiators, the, 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 sorry, the, the UK Gladiator Revival, you know, and you know, he's now married to Mickey James and worked for TNA as a uh, Magnus, um, and Stu Sanders, who obviously went on to become WWE's uh, Wade Barrett. 
amongst other people as well, you know. Um, and we were terrified. It was, you know, we were terrified um, at first, you know, to kind of do things. And it was Paul Robinson who um, selected us and told us to get in the ring. Um, and the first thing we learned was how to run the ropes. Um, and it was, I don't know, it was quite, it was quite terrifying, if being deadly honest. Like, you know, obviously we were 15, 16 at the time. And, you know, we'd, we, you know, we got into this whole world of, of, of wrestling and seeing how, how different it was to kind of what we thought. And it was very difficult for us to kind of go back and tell our parents. And so we waited. Um, you, know, we, we, you know, for whatever reason, we still didn't go back. And we then went to a uh, live event at Wembley in October of that year. And Ildi had decided, um, so I will call Dan Ildi, Ildi um, throughout this podcast quite a lot. Um, That's fine. Yeah, Ildi had decided that, you know, we had a thing called EMA, and I know the younger listeners of uh, this they were thinking, what the hell is EMA? Uh, I think you, you should be aware of it, you know. I'm aware EMA. of it. Uh, it's quite the, I'm shocked and disturbed the fact that kids these days don't get it, and I don't know how they survive without it. It was literally a lifesaver. Um, you know, it was thirty pound a week for just going to school, essentially. You know, or, or college. You know, or high. You know, uh, you know, uh, at that point now, sixth form. Um, and you know, it was basically thirty pound a week. You know, for just attending your lessons. And we had worked out that you know, once you take off, kind of, you know, going out, food and cigarettes and all that kind of stuff. You know, the essentials. And yeah. you know, once we kind of figured that out. So that we figured out we could attend like two sessions a month, you know, because obviously the travel there and obviously the, the training subs, and you know we worked it all out that we'd go, and it got to you know we did like the two weeks and we went to have two weeks and then a third week off and two weeks and another week off, and it got to sec after the second week and we we're just like yeah we want to do this, and we you know we found a way to shuffle some money about and you know here we are you know uh, <laughs> many years later. Yeah, I mean, so fast forwarding, obviously, from uh, back from 2004 all the way up to now, and now being uh, the head booker and trainer at, at Drop Kicks. I mean, what kind? Of, you said you were quite nervous about, obviously, a little bit apprehensive about stepping into in, not only into the ring but also turning up for training. Um, and I know when I was a youngster, I was uh, apprehensive, and even as a, as an adult, I was apprehensive coming in um, to wrestling training. What kind of uh, advice uh, would you give to to people i'm in an r in whether to whether to decide to come and train to become a wrestler i think if it's something that you really want to do in life it's important to do it and it's a case where you'll have to decide and, and determine for yourself very quickly if it's something which you can do and if you, if you can do it i'd advise to do it i think obviously there's there's, there's now we live in this territory here and elsewhere, where there's there's an abundance of training schools about, there's abundance of um, wrestling about in general, um, and I think this needs to work in a lot of those people's favour, favours, you know, including the older people that are getting into it. But with respect, at the moment, a lot of people are coming into the industry are young, and obviously, I'm seeing from a drop kit's point point of view anyway, that you know our keener members or our more regular members are, generally speaking, young people, so. So anyone pretty much above, you know, uh, below the age of about 20, 21, you know, we're getting that is literally about 67 percent of percent of our um, of our income. And but I say to anyone who's thinking about doing it, you know, if if you can get down and give it a try, I think it's it, it is something that's worth doing. I've personally, you know, I've met a lot of close friends, you know, through wrestling. I've had a lot of enjoyment through wrestling, um, and I know a lot of people that have had a lot of enjoyment through wrestling. I know it can be difficult to kind of, you know, come down and think and know that obviously, you know, the first time you're coming, it's not going to, you know, you, you know, you're going to know nothing. But the wall slowly kind of gets gets broken down, you know, piece by piece, brick by brick. And, you know, there's people who attend drop kicks who you wouldn't have thought would have gotten anything out of it um, initially. But then they surprise you with things, and sometimes it sometimes it takes a while for things to click for people as well. And you've got to allow that time, which I think you know people who do want to do it. That's something again which they've, they've got to face the facts of reality is like you're going to be shit for a long time, and you're going to get told that you're shit for a very long time. And 
you, you really need to kind of be able to push past that and understand that it's, that's just normal because it's something which, you know, in, in this industry, you have to work very, very hard to get to even like an acceptable level where people are willing to just book you and trust you, trust you on their shows, whether that be an academy show like ours or whether that be, you know, a bigger show or, you know, just even a smaller show, you know, in terms of just like a whole show. And people just need that commitment, really. Yeah. And I suppose for for new people who are, who are thinking about turning up now, and what what would you say is a typical training session held at, held at Dropkick? Drop because I know I've been to uh, a lot of training sessions since February now on the Wednesday sessions, and I know there's a variation of of, of training, and every week is different. Everything's fo- every week is focused on a different aspect of wrestling. What would you what would you class as a typical training session so people can get a flavour of what to expect if they were to come along to drop kicks wrestling? Well, yeah, I mean, like like you touched on there, like while obviously every week is kind of different, which is good, and obviously I like it because it's challenging for the students, obviously, and for the group because you know wrestling wrestling is one of those things where some people are better at other aspects of it, you know, than others, and vice versa. So what you may be good at, other someone else might not be. But in terms of, obviously, yeah, while the content is different, the actual format usually remains the same. As a format, to be fair, which we've had for quite some time, where, you know, we do, you know, we do, we go through a warm-up, and it's it's very important that people know that the warm-up, is not, it's not designed to really, you know, kill people, but it's designed specifically to make it a chat, enough of a challenge that people know that they've had a warm-up and they've had a workout, because we can't, as much as obviously we can sift over some things, we can't obviously ignore the fact that wrestling is a is a physical activity, and you know if people are coming to do wrestling, they need to, um, need to understand that it's a physical activity, and that you know there is a certain level of fitness that needs to be be had. Um, you know, not again, not to scare people off, but it's just a case of you know that there will be a lot of physical activity going on in the session. And so it, it gets you used to that. Obviously, we go through stretches as well. We then move on, obviously, to, on to stuff like bumps and rolls, which is fundamental to everything that we do, um, and everything that we, you know, everything else that we do in the rest of the session, whether you like or not. The bumps and rolls, you know, come into it. Um, you know, following that, you know, especially because we have, you know, I guess a great thing about drop kids. Obviously, a lot, a lot of our members are quite diverse. We have we have kids, obviously, from, you know, age of well, knee high basically, don't we? Um, you know, six or seven, some of them. And you know, we might play a couple. Incredible of games, kids you know. as well. Incredible at what oh, they do. Yeah. Make things look so easy. I know. It's, I mean, it's that, it's that no fear they have, isn't it? I think. Yeah. With respect, I mean, it's just the fact that you know. I mean, I think of the three. I think we're talking about um, you know Nino Zander and uh, Leland, I believe, and, and Max. We've uh, you know the you know the youngest is like ten. I think nine or ten. So it's a case of they will just throw themselves around. I guess because they're all brothers and friends, you know, yeah. all, all, all those lot. You know, they you know, they probably come up with all these mad ideas, you know, all week and then they save it for the Wednesday. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The Wednesday night and it's very bonkers. I, but, I'll know, happily might... say that I'm a, hu- I'm a huge fan of those kids now, let alone when they when they grow up and they're actually, you know, matured a little bit. I'm, fa- I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what they can show me every week, those kids. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just, you know, like, I'm just looking forward to the fact that obviously if they're that good now, like I said, yeah, I, I believe their their ages are between about nine or nine and thirteen, fourteen odd, and obviously you can just imagine how good they can be in a couple of years' time. And yeah. once we can get, you know, at least the, definitely the older one, we can get him on to shows and that. But I mean, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, back to obviously the, you know the thing what we do. Like obviously we're you know, up in a couple of games. Obviously it helps the younger members. You know, it's good for confidence and team building as well. You know, and then we move on to stuff like the basics. And again, like, you know, without some like a broken record here, it's just the basics are fundamental to everything that happens. Because, you know, obviously while you can have a match without like a lockup, like you can't really have a match without some of the basic stuff going in there, whether it be a wrist lock, whether it, go, whether it be stuff like your fireman's carries, you know, headlock takedowns, that kind of stuff. Like it is, and it is a case of repeat, repeat, repeat. And, you know, it does weed some people out. Um, I guess we, we all, I think we'll move on to that a bit later on anyway, but it just brings some people out of our format. But the ones who stay and stick with it, you know, they do, f- I have seen the benefit in, in the ring. Um, you know, we then move on to obviously whatever we're focusing on that session. 
And obviously we focus on different things over the past couple of months, like submissions and strikes. And, you know, I must admit, I commend you for documenting as much as possible of the stuff that we've been doing. Because I think it's been helpful to, for me as well from a coach perspective and from people, obviously, who are taking part in the session to be able to obviously watch stuff back and see, you know, see obviously where they're going right. But obviously, you know, learn, but obviously learning as well from where they're going wrong. And obviously there's no exact science to it because certain people are just better at other uh, things than other people. Um, and that's why we would date it. Like, so we've done submission, we've done strikes, I think we've done throws, we've done uh, match structure, you know, we've done all this kind of stuff. And we've had some guest trainers as well along the way. Um, and obviously, hopefully, students will just pick things up from all, the, all these different people. And obviously, mm-hmm. when we'd have matches, which we, um, you know, at the moment, especially on the Wednesday night sessions, um, I don't know if I said, but we do run sessions Wednesday nights, uh, 7 to 9.30, and on Sundays, uh, 12 to half three. Um, but especially on the Wednesday nights lately, you know, we've been getting, you know, we've been getting busier and busier and busier. And obviously, while we are trying to obviously fit matches into the Wednesday night sessions, it sometimes becomes apparent that we won't have time to kind of fit everyone in. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's it's good and commendable. And obviously, I appreciate the whole work of all the girls and guys, you know, who are coming down on on, on Wednesday nights. And obviously, we have got more time on a Sunday to go through more kind of matches because obviously the session is longer um, and at the moment it is a bit less busy so you know I do obviously implore people to try to explore you know perhaps you know, you know maybe one Sunday a month or whatever so they can see how that works and obviously have a bit more time to go we have a bit more time basically to go through matches and more feedback um, but the only thing that's, that's how a session would, would run really um, and you know like I said the content may change and the people obviously you know, um, you know, change week week upon week. Obviously, you know, most Wednesdays obviously really really busy. Um, when we are getting pretty much, you know, the same kind of. So it seems like there's about fifteen or twenty regulars now, doesn't it? Really, now. Yeah. You know where, you know, this large group basically, which just descend on the perfectly car park every Wednesday night. You know, <laughs> about seven, about five to seven. It's true. I mean, sometimes I look out my, you know, so I ride. I look at my car and then I see people just one on one by one, kind of all just getting out of their cars and like adding it up. I'm like, okay, there's about 20 people <laughs> here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it seems, seems to be getting bigger every week as well, doesn't it? It does, yeah. I mean, we've had, I think, the last few Wednesdays, I think we've had a new person every week, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, you know, it, it's going really well. And obviously, Sundays, we've had some new people welcome on Sundays. They yeah, have just been a little bit quieter lately. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, that's kind of what you get for, um, you know, for, uh, for for a session. Obviously, we have the ring mess um, on some on some weeks too. And obviously, that's, that adds like another element where obviously all the show and tell stuff will be done like in the ring, and obviously that's obviously beneficial for the booker side of me because I will see obviously how people work together in the ring, and obviously having the ring, <laughs> you know, helps that helps helps yeah, achieve so. that anyway. And and you mentioned earlier about how uh, it kind of it weeds some people out. Uh, with what their expectations are of training when they come, mm. and I know when I came training, I the uh, when I was younger, the friend of mine that I came with, Matt, at the time, all he was into was uh, I think it was Jeff Hardy and the Hardy Boys. So he he thought he was mm. just going to turn up and do flips and diving off the top rope and all stuff like that. And you can probably remember Frank as well. And like you said, it's all very he was very all up all about the basics and the fundamentals first before you even start thinking yeah. about flipping flipping uh flipping off the top rope and i think that kind of weeded him out i mean apart from uh people's expectations what where else do you see people fail when it comes to becoming a wrestler um the, the main the main the main thing is people not sorting their shit out like you know people need to understand that while you know, especially with drop. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm speaking. I'm speaking mainly from a drop perspective. You know, during this this combo. But you know, there is also from the bigger scale of things in wrestling. But from a drop perspective, anyway, there is a case where you know, time and money are the two things that obviously go into this, and hard work and commitment. You know, being the other two. And it is a case where if you don't sort your shout out, like if you don't sort out, you know, getting your training and how you're going to get the training. And you know, can you come consistently enough? That's that 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 to me, unfortunately, is the worst thing. And there are a few people. I'm not going to mention the names on on this podcast. I don't believe in doing so, but I do hope they know who they are. Who you know, they kind of come for a couple of weeks, then have like a month off, and then come back for a couple of weeks, 
and the, the you know the, the the progress is slower, you know, with those kind of people because with respect, if you're doing four sessions over two months, I've got people who are doing eight, sometimes even. 12, 16 sessions into in that time period, as well as going to the gym, as well as asking me for advice, obviously, uh, you know, through the group chat or on Facebook or, you know, calling me up or whatever. You know, I've got people who can progress through stuff much faster than your kind of four sessions every two months kind of thing. And it's a hard one because obviously, you know, like I said, going back to what I said earlier, like you will suck at this for a long time. Like, there are very few natural athletes, natural gifted athletes, and usually it's people who, with respect, have, have done sports before or done something like a martial art before, so they understand the discipline, understand the commitment. But if you have, if we're talking to Joe Bloggs who walks, on, walks in off the street, it's a case of, you know, they're going to have poor fitness, so we have to get that up. You know, they're going to have trouble probably doing stuff like forward rolls and the technique stuff, because... It does go back at times when you're first learning stuff to, you know, essentially, you know, being a, a, a three or four year old learning how to write, you know, learning how to read and write at times because it is a case of the technique is so finicky at times and, and some people can't get the, get the hang of it. And I think, whereas obviously other sports such as football, um, I mentioned football, it's the main one, football and be cricket, I guess, and even other sports to be fair, just, just other general sports. You know, those are games which, you know, generally speaking, you play at school, you know, you play with mates, you know, you can pick up things, obviously, you know, as you grow. But wrestling is a case of, you know, again, I'm, I'll, I'll never, ever, ever condone, like, backyard wrestling. And obviously, while obviously you can do stuff, obviously, in a backyard, until you're going to go to a training school to learn, you're not ever going to know kind of what you're doing until you do that. And it's very bespoke and very different from other sports in that, you know, it requires it requires a use of every single muscle in the body, like every single muscle. You know, I mean, I'm sure you can attest that the first kind of session, couple of sessions when you came back, you know, probably waking up hurting or kind of all over, you know, from yeah, some of the yeah. stuff we were doing. Even and now, probably... <laughs> <laughs> even especially it, it especially after Wednesday, I've, I feel like I've been hit by a bus after uh, Josh Shooter's uh, training session. A fantastic session like that, I thought. It was, yeah, really no, good, it was. Um, yeah, really good session. Um, really good session that was. Obviously, we look forward to having uh, Josh go down a bit more um, over the next few months, over the summer. Um, you know, I think... But I think, yeah, the main thing as well to remember is that it is hard. And I think a lot of people who kind of come down to, you know, participate in training, like, they're not used to, at times, working hard for it you know, all the things in general. And so they think, oh, you know, I'll be, I'll do this for like a couple of months and I'll be on like the shows and I'll be doing this, that and the other. But the reality is with a lot of people, they do it for a couple of months and they realise that they still can't forward roll properly. They still can't bump and feed. They still can't, you know, they still haven't got to finish. They still can't do a promo. They still, they still look like shit. Like, you know, and reality is that that scares people off because, you know, we're not, in, in, you know, we're used to obviously as we grow up, you know, from childhood, it's kind of always going to be nurtured and being told that, you know, we're good at everything. But this becomes a very adult thing when it's a case of, well, you know, you are shit for a very, very long time. Because, you know, even when you do get onto shows, on our shows, or on any show, you're going to be the least experienced person there for a very long time, you know, for at least your first year or so. And, you know, that could be after six months, nine months of training, and you're still being told you're shit. You know, you don't get that anywhere else in, in, in any other sport or any other hobby. You know, you expect once you've been doing something for a little while to kind of be good at it. But the reality is, it's, you know, for some people especially, you're talking, it could take three years, four years. It could take however long it, it, it takes to click. And, you know, I've seen it, I mean, there's a couple of people I've seen it with, um, you know, where they, as well, I think you've got to be able to be able to have that turning point in your kind of wrestling career, so to speak, where, you know, you have that moment where it just clicks. And I mean, one of the guys in the roster, Taylor Essex, um, is the best example of that, really, where, um, you know, talking out of K-Fabe, Mel Aiden, um, you know, he, originally he came and he impressed because he, he, he's good, he's, he's, he's athletic. And, you know, he's done a lot of sporting stuff in the past, uh, mainly obviously at school. But, you know, he kept himself fit. 
and you know he's good at some of that stuff, but he was he had no confidence, he had no self belief, and you know it was kind of disheartening almost to see him in the ring. But then something happened where he got injured. He had a minor injury, and then he kind of made the decision when he came back to kind of really focus on you know doing good at this and giving it giving it his best shot. And we gave him this character of Taylor Essex. Um, the obviously Essex part coming from the fact that we are you know we're an Essex based training school and proud. You know, we're proud of our roots and, you know, and the Taylor coming from the fact that obviously at the time, Tyler Breeze was obviously uh, making waves on the main roster and Dudder Bree and so it all kind of fit because, you know, with respect, you know, Taylor Adams, you know, he's, he's an attractive guy and, you know, he, you know, he has that look that he pumped that fans want to see. And we thought, I thought, no way would he, you know, we do this gimmick and no way would it work. And a lot of people did think that as well. But, you know, he's, you know, fast forward a few months, you know, about six, seven months now. And, you know, he's, one of, he's probably, and I'm going to get hate from a lot of the Dropkicks boys listening to this um, for saying this, but he, he, I'd say he's pretty much the most over person on our shows. You know, coming from someone who didn't even want to speak or do a promo and, you know, wanted to give it up at one point, you know, he's someone who now is obviously sitting in a position where a lot of the, Guys and girls, you know, should be envious of because he's, he's you know, but he's worked hard to, to you know, to get there. Um, you know, he's one of my favourite parts of the show. So from a promoter, I'm book of effective, of chocolates anyway. Um, but yeah, the, the uh, main answer to your question though is just people need to be determined to keep at it. And whether that's through drop kicks or through another training school, it's just about remembering that, you know, you are going to have to just work as hard as you physically can. If you think you're working as hard as you can. But you're not working half, half as hard as you should be. That's all I'd say anyway. I mean, in, re- in regards to Taylor as well, a- Aiden, uh, the, the, he does these uh, live videos every time he comes out with his mm. entrance with a selfie stick. And for anybody yeah. who wants a little bit of entertainment, I highly suggest that they go and follow his uh, his Facebook page because it really gets you involved in the atmosphere and it gives you a flavour <laughs> of what his character is all about as well. And I mean, you know, oh, there's but- not. There's there's not only Aiden that we have uh, at drop kicks and I, I mean I've been hit going there since March uh, Feb time now and I know and you definitely know being around all the guys and girls how much of a crop of talent drop kicks has I mean there's there's a variation of shapes ages sizes all sorts of personalities and, and characters I mean with the talent you have the future's looking bright for drop kicks what do you see and what do you want to try and sculpt out of uh, Dropkick's wrestling in the coming years? Well, yeah, my goal, when I took over from John, uh, John Ritchie, who, I'll say this now just so, just so it's out there, because I don't, don't know whether he's listened to it or people who, you know, know him, I'm going listen, to listen to this and it's the feedback, but I'll say this now, you know, I have the utmost most respect for John. Um, he's someone who, obviously, he, you know, he gave me my stop in wrestling, you know, um, first as an MC and a referee, and then obviously as a wrestler. And you know, I have utmost respect for the old style and the old everything. But my goal was to bring drop kicks kind of into the 21st century. And I think it got to a point with John where it was looking unlikely that was going to happen while he was still in charge. And I say this because it. He, he just didn't want to move with the times. He didn't really like the flying stuff. He didn't really understand the, kind of, you know, the kicks and flip style, basically, which, while obviously sometimes it, I really wrap my brain with, you know, it really kind of drives me wild with some of the stuff. There is still, you know, it is still, I guess, a, a part where it is something which paying punters want to see. It's just a case of, you know, let's try and promote that stuff because by promoting, obviously, what you're paying, pun, you're paying public want to see, you're going to get an audience and you know from a running perspective as well I wanted to make it fairer because I felt that for a long time a lot of stuff wasn't done fairly and sometimes I believe I'm too fair and I give people too many chances but it's the way that I've seen that has worked and it's I've, I've said this as well like you know from when I've taken over and I you know until like well and it's ongoing that if I'm going to make anything out of this I want to do it my way and do it the way which I feel comfortable doing. And so, you know, because I don't want to be sitting, you know, at a big kind of arena slash, 
the massive hall show, knowing that you know I've, I've I've only got that because I've had to kind of mug people off, you know, on route. I want to do it, you know, based on obviously the, how I am and the people, and I want the people obviously who've stayed loyal to drop kicks, um, you know, to get that success too and get that reward. And obviously, it may never happen. You know, we're talking about obviously, you know, hypothetically here. You know, and obviously, I'm I'm always striving to make us bigger. And that's, you know, the, the other part as well, I think. John didn't, uh, you know, there was a period where we were still kind of seen as this really small fry kind of training school based on Essex, running shows about five minutes from out where we train. And obviously, I've taken some gambles, you know, this year and last year. And some have worked, some have not worked. And, you know, I'm still obviously trying to grow our, our, our audience in Essex. And, you know, but now, obviously, the case of looking a bit further afield. And obviously, the next goal, kind of after you know, following on from everything I've just said, is obviously to look at securing some funding, um, you know, for drop kicks. And obviously, if anyone who's listening can assist with that, it's just because I think we've reached this point where if we don't get funding, we're at a risk of basically peaking. And it'd be tragic to peak knowing that we could do much at the level we're doing, which, again, I don't want to disrespect any of the venues we do run. Obviously, they're great venues, they're great halls. and We do work with some really fantastic people who help us out a lot. But it's a case of there is a bigger picture here. Um, and there are guys on the roster and guys who are obviously training, um, you know, who I've, I believe their gift and, you know, our product as a whole should be, um, you know, viewed by a bigger audience. And, you know, getting a bigger audience requires a bigger haul, requires, unfortunately, you know, like with anything in life, it comes down to money. Um, and with the team I've got at the moment and the students we've got at the moment, you know, funding, again, going towards shows, but also from a trainer's perspective, going towards hopefully creating some sort of full-time training facility in Essex again. We've had one before. It wasn't run the best, and you know, you know, perhaps you know we can live and learn from what we did, what we did wrong, or what we did right before. But I think now, definitely, we've got the team, and we've got the hunger, and it is something which is definitely missing in Essex. You know, a full-time unit um, training facility. I think it's definitely missing. Um, but yeah, it's just to make basically in, in, in summary, it's just to make it you know, bigger than what it's been. You know, because I believe we can do if, if, if promotions like Progress can come in come along, you know, during our lifespan and kind of, you know, I love, you know, I'm not going to lie, you know, I enjoy progress too, but, you know, in the day, they've eclipsed us within our lifespan. And we've got to remember, a lot of people need to remember as well, like, you know, Jockers was, was one of the first training schools, you know, about, you know, established in 1998, you know, long before even like your IPWs and everywhere else, like, you know, Lucha and all that kind of stuff, you know, we was around before that. You know, we you know we gave the first kind of crop of talent their breaks. You know, via the Hamblock shows and then via our own shows, and leading obviously onto stuff that went onto onto the very early days of the British independent <clears throat> scene revival, so to speak, in the early 2000s. A lot of those people stepped through drop kicks, um, and so it's about reminding people of that you know politely and in my own way, but. Um, just making it as big as I can. Sounds exciting. I was looking forward to being involved in it as well. And uh, I mean, w- with the guys and girls that are there, in terms of their characters, their personas, and how uh, the characters they come out with on shows, do they come up with that themselves, or is that something they discuss with you, or is that something you kind of you, you kind of spot something in one of the guys and girls, and you you approach them with an idea for a character? Well, yeah, I mean, everything with me, really, from booking perspective, is like a two-way street. And it's a case of where, whereas I'd say the majority of the time it is me suggesting things for people to do, there is also a lot of creative freedom that goes on with drop kicks. And the reason being for that is I always believe the best characters are, people, are characters that are just extensions of, the, of what's already in there as a, as a human being. And, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a plethora, there's a different people at drop kicks, and you know, different things going on. And, you know, it's a case of nowadays, you know, on my, on the shows, I look at it from a checklist point of view and there's no, sometimes it's just timing as well. I mean, with respect, it's like when, you know, the, the Taylor Essex gimmick, you know, I'm sorry to keep using him, but Taylor Essex gimmick, obviously when it was suggested, it was something I was missing on the show. 
And so it was a case of, right, let's get this on the show. But if someone else suggests it, it's a case of, well, I've got to think, well, someone else, you know, I don't want, obviously, Aiden's spot to be jeopardised. And so it's a case of, well, you know, it's not really going to work. But if you just someone that's completely different and it's another box, um, then that's great. And obviously we've got some really interesting things happening in the next few months at Dropkicks you know, in terms of story and sort of characters. But we've got some new characters, you know, coming out of this, um, coming, uh, you know, coming onto the shows that tick even more boxes. You know, we'll have, mass- we have a massive monster debuting very soon. We'll have, you know, we've got a anti essex gimmick, you know, debuting. Um, we've got, you know, much more than just your generic good guy, bad guy kind of stuff. And I think in this day and age, you know, fans deserve, our fans deserve the best and they deserve to see something different. I don't want to see the same old, same old every show. And, you know, and that's not to get anyone, that's just saying a lot of what's out there at the moment is just, oh, you know, it's you cheer him because he's from here and boo him because he's not from there. But it's kind of, it, it, we can add some more depth to the characters. The guys as well and the girls, you know, they're really good at coming out with character stuff. And so I think it's a wasted talent. Well, it's a wasted opportunity to not have them have a say in obviously what they want to do because if the performer is behind, you know, performer or wrestler in this case, is behind what they're doing and what they're portraying, then it will make it much easier for the fans to see. Because fans see stuff which, you know, people don't think of, you know, that they do see. If people are, you know, enjoying a character, you know, they see that. And it will resonate with them, and they'll have build that connection. But they see that someone's not enjoying it; they can tell, and it won't get behind that character. So, uh, I mean, you you talk about the checklist of uh, of the roster and uh, possible gaps in the roster that you could look to get filled. And I think now I have you on my podcast, and whilst you're here, I think it's only right that I, I want to propose my character to you, Lucas, right now. How would you feel about that? Put me, on the spot, on, put me on the spot, but that's what they all do anyway. So that's well, well, <laughs> well, picture this. The name is Sandy Perm. Bear with me. Sandy mm. Perm. I'm a, I'm a yeah. hairdresser. I've just recently left my salon in Ashford, Kent. And the reason being is my I'm head. sick. I'm sickened by the state that wrestlers keep their hair in. Absolutely sickened by it. And I want to tear tear them apart because of the way they keep their hair i i want to come out to wham i'm your man and hairspray everywhere come out with some scissors what do you think oh, i mean personally personally um, i smell money i mean um i think uh vincent man in the 80s might smell money for that um you know um, it, it's very good again i must admit you know i do like the gimmicky stuff wrestling. don't crush um, my dreams lucas but um, no, no, no. I'm, I'm saying I prefer characters. I do like characters, and um, it's something which, while obviously a little bit dated, it can be brought forward, you know, to to a modern era. But I don't know. Do people? I don't know. I don't, I don't think people have that same relationship with their barbers anymore that they used to, perhaps, or about you know their hair. They do care and their appearance they care, but I don't know. It, I mean, it's a very touchy subject. It's an ethics for where we run shows, to be fair. Because I think, um, you know, a lot of people have different thoughts on what is good hair and what is not good hair. Uh, um, yeah, I like the way you're trying to turn this. It, it's not, I like the way you're trying to still, you can work this. I can tell you're trying to work this in. It's very clever because I, I, it's safe to say that uh, Sandy Perm is definitely not my proposed character. But thank you for being I, so yeah, gentle. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, I, I, I figured that. But I thought we're tuned with your idea now for listeners who... Um, you know, might want to see how a thought process goes on in terms of how to how to how to book. But you can, if you have, I think any character that has a purpose. Again, this is another thing. Going back to your kind of initial question about the characters, though, any character that kind of has a purpose can work. So, regardless of what the character is, if they have a purpose in the ring and why they're in the ring, and they can get fans to believe that, then it can work. And proof. You know, the, the proof is there for, you know, a lot of the kind of crazier gimmicks in wrestling that did obviously end up, you know, in situations where they, you know, you know, had to success. And success is, is much different in, this, in, in, this, in, in wrestling. You know, success to some is that there's title reigns and main events and, you know, but to success to a lot of characters 
is just staying employed. And there is, you have to go look at the fact that as much as Santino Morella may really grind people's gears or, or grind people's gears when he was obviously on the main roster, we have got to look at the fact that he kept that character yeah. going Future Hall of Famer. for, you know, about six, seven years, I think, in the end, you know, yeah. all in, about six, seven years. And he had, you know, during that time, he had some main event matches in that character, which, fair enough, some people listen to this and I think that's dog shit, and some people listen to this and think thought he, was, he was hilarious. But he kept a job in the double in the WWE in a competitive market, you know, um, where other people had failed, other more successful wrestlers and t- more talented wrestlers. Also, as well, what we need to define with people who do character acts is that they generally speaking are the best wrestlers on, on the card. But it's just the fact that they haven't got the look, or they haven't got the size, or they haven't got the charisma in terms of what you know a main event guy would have. Because I mean, look at the uh, original Doink. You know, he was a very very talented mat wrestler who was able to, you know, when he didn't have the face paint, I uh, do forget the performer's name. I'm sure there'll be people uh, who will know and will probably tweet and Facebook this, but I forget the performer. I think it was Matt something. I believe he died a few years ago. But anyway, he was a very, very good wrestler. And there's been matches, obviously, that I've seen of his where he's not had been in the doink gear. And it's just been like watching a, you know, a normal wrestling match. And, you know, a very good one like that as well. And a lot of people forget that. I mean, it's easy to say about the Blue Blazer thing. Like, you know, that was Owen Hart. He's probably one of the top ten wrestlers of all time. Yeah. You know, it was a ridiculous gimmick that he was given, um, but it was a case of the wrestler behind it was very good. So a lot of people forget that. that a lot of the people that do do these characters, generally speaking, are very, very talented, talented workers. And the same really on our, the same really on, the same from a lot of effective. Because again, going back to the checklist, it's a case of, you know, you can't have everyone just be, you know your generic big guy throwing around or small yeah. guy who does a couple of high flying moves. You've got to have, you know, because again, the main reason that, you know, fans are watching the family, you know, we do family events, you know, if anyone listening, you know, it's all family wrestling is that they want to be entertained. And so you've got to be able to entertain them. And kids in, in particular, like, but they like the characters, they like the colorful characters. And so the wacky is the best to an extent, to be fair. Oh, good. So, so what? So, really, what we're saying is, guys, if you, if you're if you're out there and you've got this hairdresser character and you really feel strongly about it, there's a spot for you open on on, on the Dropkicks roster. So, well, perhaps, yeah. I mean, that, that's but, not the hairdresser one, but you know, the, 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 you know, I think if you can prove that you have a purpose in that, then I don't see why a character you know couldn't work on a family show. Um, you know, I believe now fans are just looking for something different. Looking something different yeah. in wrestling, and looking something different for different in characters, and the stuff that was working, you know, five, ten years ago from now, uh, ago, you know, previously, you know, just isn't going to work now. Yeah. Um, but that's fine, and that's where, again, going back to the other question about obviously the goals that I have, it's a case of you know I do want to take us past just being, you know, just being, you know, baited basically, um, as, as, as that's how I felt we were before, but now I feel that we're more current. I think basically in particular like the gimmicks like the Taylor Essex gimmick. Um we've back enough at him though, but but even like um you know, Jack Walker who's new on our new to our roster in terms of that character, um, you know, the character he's playing before, you know, he was a good character but he wasn't feeling it. But I think this new character and this new kind of style that he's got is really gonna be current and resonate with a lot of our fans. And I believe that there's other characters, you know, that are out there that are on on my roster too. You know, and it's it's really exciting time think, for our fans. Oh, definitely, and I mean we've spoken to Lucas, uh, the head trainer of uh, of, of Drop Kicks, the Booker. Um, I would like to speak to Lucas, the fan. And so the first question I'd like to say to you, Lucas, is what would be the one match that is your favourite match, and would be a match you would always kind of point people to to kind of see you know the wrestling match 101 it kind of has everything in it and it ticks every box for you what's your your favorite match oh god that's pretty really hard because there's different the matches spot. there's different good matches for you know for different reasons i mean one of oh my god this is really hard i mean one of my favorite matches um you know one of my favorite matches 
is The Undertaker versus Jeff Hardy, the ladder match they had. I think it was on Raw in about 2002. Yeah, great match, yeah. And it's a fantastic match, and I know it probably answers people who were going to expect of me, um, and they might something I've got insane, but it really, really tells a story of, to be fair, the hard work that goes into wrestling, you know, and the story that, you know, gets told through it in terms of, you know, the outcome and how, when you look at it from the, you know, if you look at it on, on paper, it just seems as, you know, you read the results as a case of, well, I'm taking a big Chef Hardy ladder match. But it really was an example where, you know, and there's been many other matches like this too, where the loser of the match actually kind of comes out looking a million looking bucks. Better, yeah. And Jeff Hardy was, you know, he was made from that from that point, really. Um, you know, he, he had a lot of moments before that, don't get me wrong, and, you know, obviously a lot of moments after that. But I always kind of look back at that moment as going, like, this is when Jeff Hardy was taken seriously. Um, but, I mean, there's other classic matches, too. I mean... It's a good choice of know, match. Again. Well done. I wasn't expecting yeah, that answer myself. Yeah. I thought it was going to be uh, yeah. Owen Hart, uh, Stone Cold. That's normally uh, everyone else's answer to that one. <laughs> no, no, Brett, sorry. Yeah, yeah, Brett Stone Cold. Well, yeah, yeah but no, 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 there's so many, though. I mean, that, that's, one, that's one of my favourites from a story perspective. I mean, when I answer this question, I mean, yeah, like, the other two... Well, my favourite wrestling moment, and again, it's not even after the best match, but my favourite wrestling moment of either guy's careers, to be fair, my favourite wrestling moment into the Ray was Eddie Guerrero winning the WWE title. That's my all-time favourite moment. Yeah. And because I think as fans, you know, you Eddie Guerrero was one of those where you saw more than just a wrestler. You know, you saw his story and his struggle. And, you know, Eddie Guerrero versus Brock Lesnar from No Way Out 2004, while not, both men have had better matches in terms of, you know, content and story or whatever. But just that moment at the end when Eddie Guerrero is raising the, you know, the Dudley title, you know, it, 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 it speaks volumes. It, it, it's just a phenomenal moment. And it's, it's unfortunately even more heartbreaking, obviously, getting, obviously what happened, you know, following that. And the fact that, you know, it was within, you know, not, you know, criminally, his last kind of year, year and a half, you know, yeah. alive. And it's it's a phenomenal match. Um, you know, it's made, it's, it's, a, it's a good match made even better by, obviously, the fact that it was, you know, his only title, you know, world title that he had won. You know, and, you know, even he's... There's a lot of Eddie, Eddie Graham matches as well that I've, uh, I've enjoyed. I mean, he's one of my favourite wrestlers, you know, um, you know, kind of when I got older as a fan. You know, obviously Sting, as like I said previously, has been the person I've always followed, um, apart from his later, later teenage days. Um, but, you know, people like Jeff Hardy and um, RVD have always been a fan of. But Eddie Graham was, you know, he was just, I don't know, he was just remarkable. Um, Shawn Michaels and Triple H another good shout out for that one um, you know from Summer 2002 yeah. you know that's when I just realised Shawn Michaels was probably you know top two pretty much of all time you know to be able to come back after that kind of injury but in terms of obviously for people looking to get into the business I mean I'll answer this a bit more professionally now but I've kind of marked out a little bit there <laughs> but you know we're entitled to be fans we're know. all fans but we're all fans yeah, no, I'd answer from an education point of view. I'd say that the best kind of matches to watch are matches where you can see yourself in one of the two wrestlers. And obviously, you have got to be realistic here. So I don't want, you know, Lewis Barrett, love you, but I don't want Lewis Barrett watching a Big Show match and going, I see myself as Big Show. Because realistically, yeah. that's, not, he's, he, that's not really what he's going to be doing. But I think the best kind of matches to watch from, from a learning effect are the ones where, you know, you pick up something from that from from those people whatever trait it may be um and also ones where you have got to watch different stuff at different times because something i've pointed out to a lot of students lately is even if you watch matches from 2013 and people go oh like, this is something was shit to the degree or like, i didn't like this and like that but if you watch matches you have to a couple of years ago it's so weird but you will pick up so much because things in wrestling just go in and out of love. 
And so, I mean, one one move in particular, which was being done so regularly, you know, that it was becoming almost like some sort of wrestling cancer at one point, was the um, was the the, the uh, kind of the big toss into the into the into the turnbuckle, you know, and it was being done so regularly. You know, I mean, Triple H was always one who you should love taking it and Shawn, or doing it to Shawn Michaels. But it was done so regularly um, up to, you know, up to literally about 2013, 2014, because um, Orton was doing it at one point as well. Um, yeah. And then you look, at ma- you look at matches now, that move does not exist. And that's no, just one yeah, example yeah. Of, of a move that, you know, literally two or three years ago was being done like every match and is now just not. I mean, yeah. again, top vote clothesline. Now that Kane's obviously taken a break, yeah. when do you hit top, see a top vote clothesline anymore? It's, it's so, like, you know, it's it, like it, super kicks now. Super kicks. Well, exactly, Every, yeah. And we're not back on it. It might as well just be a, a strike now. It's ridiculous. Well, exactly, yeah. It's, it's, it's basically, you know, it's basically a shine at this point to some people. Yeah. But, you know, what I always say to people is even, you know, you have to watch a variety of wrestling. Um, and sometimes you can pick stuff up just from watching stuff just a couple of years ago. And it's, it, like I said, it sounds strange, but it's just a case that things go in and out of love of wrestling and you do forget things. And there will be stuff that you'll see in some matches from, you know, just the recent past where you'll be like, oh, like that's different. That's new. That's something which I can incorporate into my, into my kind of get, get up. And, you, do, you know, if we do it now, people go, oh, wow, where did that come from? And then, you know, you'll just be like, well, it came from a match in like 2013, you know. Because you've got to remember, what the, you know, the rest have changed in WWE as well since then. You know, Christian was wrestling in, in the company up until, you know, 2013, 2014, I believe. And, you know, he, you know, he's finished with the Unprettier. Then I think Tyler Breeze has just started using it again now. But yeah. again, that went out of favour. You know, and so did really face busted in general for a while, you know, in, for ages. You know, you obviously CM Punk with the Bulldog out the corner. You know, I think they've just started bringing that kind of stuff back now. But again, that shows my point that new people now bring them back and people go, oh, wow, that's cool. But then yeah. watch a CM Punk match, watch a, watch a yeah. Christian match, you know, watch a Chris Jericho match even from about three, four years ago. All that stuff's in there, and more yeah. that you might be able, that you just don't go, uh, you know, that won't go reported. Oh, I'm gonna have to search uh, search the WWE Network for <laughs> between 2011 and 13 now for a few uh, missing spots that I can add in. I like that. That's a good. That's no, a, that really was a do. good I, answer. I, I like that, that answer. That's, that's, that's good. My take. <laughs> that my take anyway. And uh, so in today's uh, roster of WWE NXT, who is your standout? Who is your you're following very closely, and you like everything about right now? I think that, yeah, there's a handful of people really. Uh, we start with the main roster. Um, on the main roster, I believe that Sami Zayn needs to be given a chance. Um, I believe that he he has a lot of the ingredients. Um, but he is that fear of kind of being Zach Ryder. Um, yeah. People, then Zach Ryder, brilliant. It, yeah, it, it, it's criminal that, unfortunately, that, you know, I have got, we have got to accept the fact that, you know, a majority of your audience probably would be people who probably only got into wrestling about two, three years ago and would have missed this whole Zach Ryder movement and wondering what the fuck we're talking about Zach Ryder. Um, you know, you know, all the... Other, the one that's not Bojo Rawley from the hype programs, as most young people probably know him now. Yeah. But there was a time when Zack Ryder was, you know, was hot shit. Like, he was, like... His know, YouTube show, show wasn't it? Over. Yeah, he was at YouTube show. It was, you know, it all kind of linked in, his little fake belt, and then obviously he was, you know, they did just seem to be in Long Island, like, every week for some reason. <laughs> um, and so it was a case of, you know, he was getting a lot of support, and you listen to the pop, when he won the US title, like, my God, it was insane. Yeah. Um, I think he beat Ziggler, I believe. Um, you know, it, it was just off the roof. And, you know, again, there was a time where he was involved in essentially in John Cena's storyline, which, again, love him or hate him, he is always going to be the, yeah. the guy in WWE. And if you're involved with someone with John Cena, like, you're in the main event storyline, like, regardless of what else is going on in the title picture or, you know, whoever else is showing up on the show, like, you're, you are the guy. Yeah. And, you know, Sami Zayn is kind of in that position now where, you know, he's been on the main roster for a year, I believe, and he's not been up to much. But he's a very, very talented wrestler. And it's a case of, you know, if he doesn't get an opportunity, he'd be good. 
Um, I guess the person, obviously, of the year, really, is going to be Shinji Nakamura. He's a story, really, which everyone's going to be talking about. And you kind of be saying not to. Do you know what I mean? Like, he's a guy who, you know, people want to, want to see do well. And something which, you know, I found, you know, at the moment, the degree of struggle, which, which, which is where they're going to struggle, really, is the fact that they have got, uh, even though they've got new stars, their roster, age-wise, is still quite old. And, you know, they have only got a certain time period to cash in on some of these people's best years because they have got to face the fact that people like AJ Styles are in their 40s. Shinsuke is 38, 39. John Cena I can't himself, believe that. You know, is like, it's mad, yeah. It's mad. But again, it's, it's, down to the, it's down to how wrestling is now and how... You know, like, like we've said, even from a drop perspective, it does just take time to get good or to get noticed. And it's something with a lot of these guys. Fair enough, yeah, some of it has been from WWE side. But for the most part, and there's something which um, Adam Rose, who did a seminar for us back in November last year, he did say, he said that WWE are looking for people who have fan bases because that fan base will then follow them into the WWE product. And it ties in with a lot of the people that have signed in the past kind of year or two into NXT. Because yeah. in, in like Bobby Root coming into NXT, he was known. And his fans knew him. The fans knew he was coming in. And so that probably brought over a few viewers, a few subscribers or whatever, um, to a network to see Bobby Root in NXT. And the same thing with people like Kenta, Hideo Tami. You know, he brought a fan base over from Japan. You know, I'd argue Shinji probably got his break first because Hideo can't seem to keep his body attached um, you know great worker but unfortunately he's been yeah. cursed with injuries in Dead of Ray. but they have got to face the fact that Ray that you know the, the majority of the roster is, is, is old and so you know how long are they going to be able to go for at a main event standard and I, my answer really is unless you're kind of John Cena probably not very, very, very long you know because uh, you know they built up you know Shinnikis already had like a 20 year wrestling career but oh, just starting, he's got a very wrestling career, which is kind of a really weird statement to say, especially when you look at how it was perhaps around 2000, 2000 and 2005, when they were going, right, you know, if you're 19, 20 years old and you look good, like, we're basically going to hire you and just make it work, you know. But now it's the case of we like people to learn their craft, which is good. Same with people like McIntyre and Ginger, you know, we have to mention them. Um, we're stupid not to Jinder Mahal who have you know got released in 2014 after probably the most diabolical kind of booking push or deep Free push um, <laughs> ever yeah um, no in 3MB yeah you know left the company pretty much as laughing stocks and you know Drew obviously is doing a great job in NXT and he did that where he he needed that time off to kind of go elsewhere and to kind of come back to the company and is in the much better position for doing so because he was a laughing stock. And Jinder, obviously, you know, we'll be so silly not to speak about Jinder Mahal in this podcast because he is the current WWE champion um, and has made probably the biggest rags to riches kind of transformation that's been Definitely. seen in a long time in wrestling. Um, because, you know, even, I mean, people keep sharing stuff on Facebook, I keep seeing, you know, they're sharing stuff like, you know, at the moment, because obviously it was around this time last year when he, when obviously he did reappear. But, you know, this time, like last year, he was doing, like, you know, shitty indie shows and, you know, God knows where, you know, and not, not even at the main draw or anything, just kind of on the show with other people. Um, and obviously, you know, again, going into like July, August, he was just literally introduced, reintroduced again as basically a jobber. And now he is <laughs> WWE yeah. champion. Uh, um, I saw a rumour today as well. Oh, I saw a rumour that, uh, what, what was the match? Uh, I think it was uh, the great Carly had with Undertaker. It was like the Punjabi, it was like Hell in a Cell, Punjabi but it was prison. just prison. Punjabi prison. That There's a rumour that uh, that Jinder may be bringing that That's back happened, for, for, for Alton. Uh, I think uh, I'll be interested to see that. I would, to be fair. I'm, in, I'm interested, I guess, but I think after the House of Horrors shambles, I've got to be very careful with yeah. how they, they do things. Yeah. It wasn't well received last time. Uh, well, I think last time wasn't it that Kai didn't even, even, even do the match at the end, didn't they? I can't even remember. No, um, I can't. He ended up being on top of the big. Probably, like, yeah. Years ago now. Um, in terms of NXT, though, I'd argue there's a lot of people in the women's division doing very well. 
Um, I'm, very, I'm big, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, match. I know people some people like them. I'm a big fan of Billy Kay and Peyton Royce. I think they've got a good act. Which, while it is very similar to that stuff like that we've seen before in the women's division, which I guess they have got to address because it does seem that there can be no villain stable um, yeah. with women who aren't just like horrible bitches essentially. Do you know what I mean? There can be no villain stable. Like you know, they've had the BFFs before. They've had. You know, lay call obviously um, when they were literally just being bitches, and they, they need to address the fact. You know, again, they say obviously the women's revolution and they're moving on with it, but in the case of they are still essentially just doing Lyndon Lohan's characters from Mean Girls, and that film was released about 15 years ago. We tend to feel old as fuck, <laughs> <laughs> but you know that film was released about 15 years ago, and they're still doing female characters based on that Lindsay Lohan character. You know, and you know, and you ask yourself sometimes, you know, it's changed, but has it really changed? You know, they're still using that kind of thing from about 15 years ago. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of people down in NXT, which, you know, they do need to keep them in NXT, though. I mean, this is the problem they're having, where a lot of people get called up to the main roster and don't do much for a long time. You know, Apollo Crews, I, I totally forgot, was, was employed until I saw him with Titus and Neil on Raw a few weeks back. I, you know, and he's been on the main roster about a year now. Yeah. Um, you know, since since, since the brand cut. I mean, and let let's be doing well um, for herself. I don't yeah. think it's got a lot of heat. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't see why. I think it's just probably some jealousy there. But um, you know, there's, there's a lot of talent in WWE, and uh, I always say to people though as well, like just like who you like, and don't be afraid of it. And this is why I'm saying right now, you know, my favorite, my one of my favorite wrestlers is John Cena. And there's people probably booing the podcast now, and maybe even turned it <laughs> off, or got you know we're going to riot t-shirts on all that. I've, stuff, just, I've just lost the subscribers because of you, Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you're probably going to gain some same gain some kids. Yeah. Um, but I will say he is he probably is pound for pound like you know like the the kind of epitome of a wrestler when you think about it. Like everyone knows who he is, even non wrestling fans know who he is because obviously he's doing stuff obviously outside the company now. Um, you know, which is obviously, you know, helping him and helping the company. Um, but he is kind of a standard bearer, really, for, you know, what a wrestler should be. And his work ethic, it, it cannot be faulted. You know, regardless of what people say about his in-ring work, and there is obviously that weird kind of corner of the internet who think that, you know, John Cena gets carried in every single match that he's ever had. And, you know, he can't, can't do this, can't do that. And there is part of me, even in some of these matches, where I do think now, the only criticism I do have of John Cena at the moment, and it's been for like the past couple of years, is that working against him, your finisher gets completely buried because, you know, his matches do tend to be the sports entertainment type of match where it is a case of first to your first finish means nothing, even your second finish sometimes. I mean, at the Rumble, then you have to do like three in a row on AJ Styles. Like, it got to the point where a finisher wasn't really a finisher, you know, and the same with his opponents, but it is obviously also entertaining to watch and dramatic for, for a fan to watch. So I can see that too. But I, I, I would sometimes like a bit of that old school kind of feeling of your finisher is your finish, and people they are, they either reverse it once, and that's fine. But when it gets hit, it gets hit, and that's it. It's a case yeah. of one, two, three, the match is over. And the best guy obviously at doing that were people like were, were probably Jay Roberts, where he had a move which everyone loved and it was a case of you knew the minute he hooked the minute he had hooked he had hooked that head that move was going to be here and that was the end of the match it didn't get who the fuck you were like you wasn't going to get up off out of that DDT and for years he protected it for years I mean it's one of those where even now to be fair if, if, if you know he, again like bless him he's back in shape and you know you know off, off the booze you know it's one of those where even now if he, if he got put in the main event match we would all know that that DDT was signal the end, or you know we'd have that thought process. We'd believe anyway that that DDT would be the end. It probably wouldn't because with respect to he's against like Roman Reigns, Roman Reigns ain't losing to nobody. But yeah, yeah. you know it is a case of potentially finisher. I think that's another thing that kind of annoys me now in wrestling. I have a lot of pet peeves, but that's that's the main thing. <laughs> well, I mean, we we could sit here and talk about wrestling uh, being two great two fans of uh, of the business all day. But I mean, uh, 
where can we learn more about drop kicks and where can we keep up to date with uh, the talent upcoming shows etc have you got any social media that we can keep an eye on yeah of course I mean, everyone does now i mean obviously we're on uh, facebook uh, search for drop kicks university of wrestling we're also on twitter at dkw academy um we do have an instagram drop kicks wrestling um you know we, we, we've got a youtube as well drop kicks just on drop kicks and uh, our website, of course, is dropkicks.com. Um, you know, our next, uh, you know, they're all our shows, obviously, always published on Facebook at events and that. Obviously, we, uh, we've got Brentwood coming up on the 29th of July. Tickets are out and they're sold through um, the Brentwood Theatre website. And we're in Gravesend on the 2nd of July, too. Um, and we're back in, we've got a good weekend in uh, August, the Bank Holiday weekend, where we're doing Langdon, followed by Westliff, uh, back-to-back. Um, on the 26th and 27th of July, of, of 26th and 27th of August, um, you know, and so we're doing shows all throughout the year, and you know we are getting busier and busier and bigger and bigger, and always looking for ways to improve, and you know it's a case where we're hoping that you know you know everyone that listens to this or people want to share this and that can get down to our events and see you've only got to see it for yourself I guess to going to see what it's about. Yeah. Exciting stuff, and I just want to say, Lucas, I'm absolutely thrilled that you decided to to join join us, uh, me and the no listeners, uh, for the very first interview uh, and second podcast of uh, Wrestling with Success. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for your time. That's no worries. I'll just give a few shout outs to people. I'm going to forget people. Yeah, of course. But you know, there is a lot of people that are training hard at the gym, and just want to say uh, thank you to people like Vinny and to Jamie. Um, thank you to Aaron, Beden, uh, Mark, um, James, um, you know, Danny Chapman, uh, Danny Rowe, uh, Lewis, Barrett, you know, there's so many people who are helping out all the time. Brett, obviously, for the ring as well. Oliver Pease, who provides the ring and does a lot of the other stuff as well and books, obviously, a lot of the guys on his, on his own shows. You know, Jack Torino, uh, Jack Walker, and Aiden, who we spoke about in a little bit more de- in depth in the, in the podcast earlier on. Uh, Cam Ream, I can really forget about that Cam Ream. Uh, Cam Ream, he's great. He comes on Sundays. Um, you know, so many guys and girls, Tamara, um, you know, and everyone really. And I just want to obviously thank you for obviously letting me be the first guest and to uh, thank everyone obviously that's working hard at the gym. And just remember that, you know, we are obviously looking to, you know, grow and expand and there's stuff and opportunities out there for people who obviously want to stay loyal and stay, and stick with us and I thank obviously yourself too Niall um, for doing so because obviously we are going through such a such, a, such an interesting time in wrestling and it'd be it'd be a shame if people miss out um, sorry uh, Kevin Hamley I must mention as well he's my right hand man every Wednesday night and Sam Dufresne who does a lot of the filming for us um, it was Luke Harding thank you but yeah I don't know if anyone I missed out just like you know Matt Ball how can I forget about him Matt Ball <laughs> God, sorry, Matt Ball the legend the living legend of course and Ben, ben Brindley Ben Doncaster, all of you guys, love you um, to bits, and yeah, um, see you all training. Well, thank you very much, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for following my journey, uh, listening to this show, and uh, guys and girls, I look forward to potentially wrestling a match with you all soon. Thank you very much, guys, and I'll speak to you next week. Thank you again for listening and people I need your help I would love it if you could pop over to iTunes to leave this podcast a review your reviews are so important to me I need to understand what you think of the show and it helps just raise awareness for everyone else on this show and not only that guys if you have a friend or a relative who you know is an avid wrestling fan please point them in this podcast's direction.